Hello, I'm Marcus Pibworth, and welcome to the Ministry of Change podcast. I know it's been quite a while since I uploaded anything. Um, I've been focused on uh, some other things. I've been really deep diving into storytelling, and so I had to put the podcast on hold while I really delved deep into that, and it's been a beautiful process, and I think it's going to enrich this as well. And uh, I guess in that context, it'd be good to start off with this little story, which I think frames the next few, at least, podcasts that I'm going to upload. And it's a story about two Japanese frogs. There's a Japanese frog from Osaka, Osaka frog, and he lives in a beautiful pond in Osaka. And there's Kyoto frog who lives in a beautiful pond in Kyoto. Osaka frog sits in his pond and he thinks this is a beautiful pond but I've heard that the ponds in Kyoto are even more beautiful than this. And Kyoto frog was sitting in his pond in Kyoto and said this pond is definitely beautiful but I hear that the ponds in Osaka are perhaps even more beautiful. Neither frog knew each other, but it just so happened that on the exact same day, at the exact same time, both decided to leave their ponds and set out for the other's city to see the ponds. And so they hopped across the land, and it just so happened that equidistant between the two ponds was a big mountain. Both the Saka frog and Kyoto frog hopped up the mountain, And at the summit, they met. Who are you and where are you going? said Osaka Frog. I am Kyoto Frog, and I am going to see the ponds of Osaka. Who are you and where are you going? I am Osaka Frog, and I am going to see the ponds of Kyoto. Ah, said Kyoto Frog. Well, we are so high up on this mountain. If we were just a little bit higher we would be able to gaze out and see each other's ponds and decide from here whether to make the rest of the journey. If I stand up on my hind legs and you stand up on your hind legs and we both rest our little front legs on each other's shoulders, then we'll be able to stare out and see. Good idea, said Osaka Frog. And so both frogs raised up on their hind legs and balanced on each other's shoulders with their front legs and they gazed out and looked at each other's ponds but the frogs forgot one thing frogs eyes are on the top of their head and so when they stood and looked out they were in fact not gazing at each other's ponds but at their own pond coyote frog said well The ponds of Osaka look exactly like the pond in Kyoto. Why would I bother making the rest of the journey? And Osaka frog looked out and he too said, well, the ponds of Kyoto look exactly the same as the ponds of Osaka. Why would I bother making the rest of the journey? And so they both lowered themselves back down. They bid each other farewell and they hopped back down the mountain. Osaka frog back to Osaka pond and Kyoto frog back to Kyoto pond. And so I, when, when I was thinking about this story, I thought about this sort of effort that we sometimes go to to raise ourselves out of a certain situation, a difficult situation. We are to find a new path in life, but then how often we when we get there, we end up looking back to the same place that we came from, not realising that. And so I thought, on this exploration into what it means to be human and how to navigate the difficult bits of life, I thought, I'm going to try and find some people which I haven't really spoken to before. And I thought, who better to find than people who have dedicated their lives to answering those questions about what it means to be here and I thought 
the best place to find them seems to be in places of spirituality. So I've been going to various temples and uh, communities and to speak to religious leaders uh, or spiritual leaders, people who have dedicated their lives to a spiritual path of understanding what it means to be human. And I thought we could get some really great perspectives on that. So this conversation, the first in this series, is with Radha Mohan Das, who is a former Hare Krishna monk and a practicing Hare Krishna devotee. And I went to the Bhakta Vedanta Hare Krishna temple uh, just outside Watford to have this conversation with him. And uh, and to follow, there are also going to be some conversations with the uh, Lama Yeshi from the Sama Ling Tibetan Monastery in Scotland, uh, and, and also Annie Lamo, who's a monk there, uh, and various other people. And I, I'm quite excited to bring it, and then obviously I'll bring more different things, and there's going to be a few stories and stuff along the way. So here you go. Here is my conversation with... Rather Mohanda. My name is Rather Mohan Das, but if you want to remember he is Richard, then that's also fine. I am a communications secretary at, here at Bhaktivedanta Tamana, Krishna Temple near Watford. I've been here for about 25, 26-ish years. I also do a lot of drama and I also do a lot of local public relations and publications and things like that and interfaith. So I'm quite active actually. And um, yeah, so I was um, a monk here at Bhaktivedanta Tamana for about the first 15 years um, of my experience here. And then more recently I've been married. I'm a married man now who live in basically the outskirts of Watford. But essentially, um, yes, I'm kind of more or less here every day, as is my wife. How does your life differ now as a married man from when you were a monk? Okay, I think that that's a good question. I think it's quite fundamental as well to the you know the Hare Krishna lifestyle because obviously you have it they have the monastic experience where people, you know, people who wear the, the orange robes, a sign of celibacy and renunciation would live in the temple environment, of course, and therefore it's a lot easier and it's indeed expected of them to have what we call better sadhana. Sadhana means you know, like more time to meditate, more time to read, and particularly to get up earlier in the morning to do meditation and take part in the hymns, the prayers. Obviously those things are open to everybody, but I think when one is married, there's more distractions, let's say, obviously. There's more yeah. distractions. And one of the benefits uh, of being um, a monk um, of any type, of any denomination, is that you, you you just concentrate on your sadhana. Whereas as a married man, obviously, you've got to put fit your sadhana in and around all the other responsibilities that come with married life, whether it's paying bills, whether it's taking the wife to work, whether it's going to the doctors, you know, whatever it might be. So I transform from that type of monastic experience to basically what I do now and frankly for me it wasn't all that difficult because I think that in the last five years of my monkhood I was going for that gradual transformation anyway where I was realizing I needed to get a balance in my spiritual life between the between the practical let's say and the responsible and and the sadhana or the you know the straightforward spiritual practice um, that said I also because I'm working here essentially kind of almost like a volunteer, um, but I do get a stipend so I can, can pay my bills. So it's not that I've changed my faith or the intensity of, of, the, of the practice of that faith. Frankly, it's been a relatively smooth ride. I wouldn't recommend that someone would go from a, a Hare Krishna monastic experience, spending time in the ashrams of India or wherever, and then suddenly getting a job in the city or you know, working, you know, in London tube station or, or yeah. something like that. I mean, some people obviously do those things, but it's not something that I could have done or would have, would have wanted to be able to do. For me, the I remember saying this to one of my seniors at the time of my transformation, that I've got to be able to justify in my heart and mind and soul the you know, 15 years as a monk, well, 15-ish years as a monk, 
you know, I can't just, I, it's got to connect what I'm doing, whether I'm married or not. I've got to justify that and then say, I've been, okay, I've been spiritually trained in my youth from the age of about 21. And I don't really know anything else. And I, when I joined the ashram, joined the monastery, I meant it. What's that mean? What I mean by that is that I really was ready for it. I really wanted to live spiritual life. It was very, very, you know, in, in an intense way. It was very important to me because it rounded off and it and and it connected with my all my questions about life and my existence, and I came to the conclusion that the only way forward was was to live spiritual life full time, you know, if for want of a better word, um, because what else can you do? What what is the purpose of my existence if it's not spiritual? I came to that conclusion in my early twenties. Before that, yes, I may have parted like everybody else but yeah. by the age of about 21 I think what happened was I was ready for, for spiritual life then I felt that I'd done all I could to try and enjoy these senses trying to you know enjoy externally if you know what I mean and it didn't work yeah. and it doesn't work for anyone really yeah, well, it seems like you found out a lot earlier than most people I think I it, it seems like that I mean, another I, decade at least on to yeah in my life of trying to do that <laughs> yeah yeah I guess so I, I'm not sure how old you are but in your 30s I'm 33 I'm 33 and I'm 49 now so I'm getting old now <laughs> I guess that's age is relative obviously but I, I guess so but I would say you know that I I suppose you could say you know quote unquote spiritually matured let's say relatively early. Um, however, it's not that I would necessarily recommend that for everyone. For most people, like you said, it's more of a gradual process. And, you know, in, in Indian tradition itself, for which the Hare Krishna tradition is part, Hinduism, um, you know, if people would get married, they would go for the, for the natural process. You know, the training, student life, then get married and, and have children. And then the spiritual aspect of it, like the increased sadhana, would really increase when the children have grown up and left home. And rather than living as a retired couple, playing bowls or just, I don't know, just going on walks or whatever, going to the pub, um, the idea is that in, in the Vedic civilization, the elderly couple would then start to go to places of pilgrimage. And, and, and then the son would even become monks, males especially, and would become monks and shave their head. Whereas I think with the, um, I suppose you could say it exists in other traditions, but it's certainly in this one where you can become a monk quite early. But the transformation from being a young monk and then realising, oh, actually, I've got to get married anyway, is a challenging one. But for, personally, for me, I was very fortunate because I'm still here. As a, you know, In other words, the, this community I'm part of is very conducive, I think, for all kinds of people, married and non-married, monastic and otherwise. So in that sense, I guess it's been part of a, I guess, a bit of a divine path for me. We, we, obviously, any path has its pebbles and has its um, has its uh, troughs yeah. or whatever, and ups and downs, but that's life. And you, that would be the case anyway, in, in regardless of what you do. That's good. I was yeah. just you, you brought up quite a few good points which I want to go I'd actually quite like to dig into around um, spiritual life I mean the part of this project has been exploring sort of things like mental health and how we navigate mm -hmm. the difficult bits of life and I think spirituality feels important in that role um, and so I'd like to go into that more but I did just pick up on when you we've sort of just jumped into it and I'm thinking there may be people listening that don't know much about the Hare Krishna movement, no, so maybe no. that would be a good place. I, I was thinking that actually, you know, so, I mean, what, I, what I've spoken about so yeah. far has been kind of generic, you know, when I talk about a monastery life, people get the general idea, yeah. but you're absolutely right, until people really know a bit more about Hare Krishna, um, or Hinduism if you like, um, specifically, it's difficult to go on. So uh, uh, I suppose I, would you like me to summarise it in a few seconds, or I mean, <laughs> I think summarise it, but maybe you can give more than a few seconds. I feel like it, it needs a bit more, yeah. a bit more than a few seconds. All right, okay. In terms of the tradition itself, it comes from ancient India. All the, the related scriptures, like the Bhagavad Purana or the Bhagavad Gita, these things. It's, it's, and, and, and I guess someone would say, well, is it Hindu? Or I mean, from a cultural point of view, you could say, well, if Hinduism means anything, that comes from India where you know, Shiva, Krishna and Vishnu are recognised, then you could say that it is 
certainly part of the Hindu culture, but it's a very specific branch, let's say. Um, we particularly relate to the great saint of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who, who was born in Bengal in the 15th century. That represents our branch or our main saint or, or our lineage. And in terms of belief system, um, you could say, well, we believe in reincarnation and karma and all these things. We practice different forms of yoga, especially back to yoga, which means loving devotion to, to a personal God. But we would say that the the purpose of the life is not to ke keep getting reincarnated again and again, but to escape from this cycle of samsara or reincarnation and go back to the kingdom of, of God, to use a, a kind of a Christian term, uh, or return to Vaikuntha, or go back home, back to Godhead, for where we belong. Um, there are certain practices that, that you know help that or are conducive to that. For example, vegetarianism. We're big in the vegetarian world. Um, obviously, chanting Hare Krishna is pretty important to us. Um, but in, okay, so I could go on and on about these things, but that's the very basics of it. You know, why do you, why do you chant Hare Krishna? Okay, I mean, ultimately, we chant Hare Krishna. The, the, uh, we do it on beads, or we can do it with music, or even without beads. But I have beads here in my, well, I keep safely in my bead bag. So Hare Krishna, it's a mantra, which means like a prayer. Man means mind, and tra means to free or to release, to free the mind from trouble. And that's very important to us. But any mantra at all in the Sanskrit language is not supposed to be just a normal lang you know, re repeating mundane words. Like Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. You know, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, like a, it's like a language that, yeah. where, in which the soul can communicate with God. Um, like, like, it, like a radio frequency of some type, where one is gradually uh, purifying one's existence and the awakening our true identity, our understanding that we are not the body, but we're the soul. That's a, it's not that we have a soul, but that's what we are. And the body is like an external vehicle. So the more we chant, we're understanding these concepts, we're becoming more detached, we're becoming um, gradually, I would say, um, gradually closer to Krishna, more love, and more love comes into our life, particularly with, with Krishna, you see who we believe to be the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, I mean, I could go into more detail, but, what I, but I also mentioned the fact that it came, this tradition came to the West, um, but uh, it was brought to the West in 1965 by Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and you've seen images of him and pictures of him yeah. here, and he's obviously very important to us, and he presented an ancient tradition by order of his own spiritual um, master, spiritual teacher. And he went on a one-way ticket on a cargo ship <coughs> from Calcutta to New York, you know, about 50-odd years ago. More than that now, actually, yeah, 55 years ago, 54 years ago. Um, I started preaching to the youth of America. Of course, it was the late 60s by then, so you know, he had a receptive, yeah. fashionable audience. And, and also even the Beatles, particularly George Harrison, of course, helped a lot. Helped some of the early American Harry Krishna devotees cut records, and he donated back to Manor Manor in, you know, in the early 70s. So this was called the Harry Krishna explosion. It, people were ready for it. People were fed up of Vietnam or the space race or the, or the Cold War, and, and, and there was CND marches back in the 60s, and people wanted answers. And there was, a, there was a large youth population. The baby boomers had become, had reached their 20s, you see, the post-war baby boomers. So it had a huge kind of cultural effect, where if you appeared on top of the pops chanting Hare Krishna, you were reaching half the nation. There was less choice in those days. Yeah. And so it couldn't be repeated, in a sense, because now we've got so much information. Um, anyway, so we, um, you know, we grew, and, and for example, just in about 12 years of Prabhupada's mission, he opened 108 temples around the world, he made over 5,000 disciples, he wrote over 70 books, from uh, translations from Sanskrit and English translation, and then purports and commentaries, opened farms, schools, even a scientific institute. So as you can imagine, it's pretty impressive. He passed away in 1977, but we, you know, we're growing as, as a community and as, a, as a, an organisation. So today we have about 700 temples around the world. That's good. Yeah. Um, I was 
was actually I was watching that and um, they have this really good documentary I'm sure you've seen the, about about the sort of Harry Krishna movement and about Prabhu Bhav. Okay, which documentary? There's a lot of documentaries. Well, there's actually. a recent one called Harry Krishna, the movement. Oh, I think I've seen that one. Yeah. It's just sort of about his sort of life and him traveling over and the spread. Oh, yeah, that was spread. I think that was released a few years ago, yeah. and I think that was in celebration of our fiftieth anniversary since yeah. the International Society was established. Obviously, it goes way back before then, but in terms of it being in the West, we celebrated. And I think one part of those celebrations included the making of the film. Well, when yeah. I, when I was watching the film, one of the things I really felt was, and I guess what I've been trying to do with this podcast and project recently is. Is I, I, I watched that and I saw all these people in the 60s, especially at this time where they felt the world needed to change. They yeah. felt yeah, yeah. like there's, I don't know, the Vietnam War, there's, there's a, all these different things converging and all the young people are saying, we, we don't accept the status quo anymore. We mm -hmm. don't accept what we're being handed down. We need uh -huh. a change. And it feels to me very relevant to now to mm. 2019 to this yeah. era where i feel we're it it's possibly just a continuation of that but it feels very much like we're in a place where we can no longer accept what the mainstream is giving us we we no longer know the future of the planet from an environmental point of view yeah, yeah possibly yeah. for the first time ever that's <laughs> that's true and plus sort of economically like the roles of we have in society and it's interesting you mention that because i was thinking that myself actually this morning um the 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 thing the concerns that um the youth had in the 60s in particular are more or less exactly the same as today yeah. but i mean obviously details are different but there seems to be more emphasis in on the environmental side and therefore vegetarianism whereas i guess in the 60s it was more about cold war cnd but it's roughly the same kind of network the main difference is today is the role of technology, Twitter, Facebook, and other gen and, and there's, there's the older generations of today, like my dad's generation, for example, he's now in his 70s. He was a teenager of the 60s. So what you have, you have a lot of support from politicians, whether it's the for, in form of the Green Party or, or any other party, who, who, so it's no longer like the youth versus the squares who are over 50, 30. Yeah. As it could have been in the uh, in the sixties, and in other words, the the age is the, the the demographic age is more spread out. So percentage wise, there's more people I think over forty than under forty today. Whereas back after the Second World War, you had a huge baby boom, and they all reached teenagers of the sixties, and they were running the economy actually by just buying pop records. So that's different, um, but the actual cause. And I think the general kind of broader support, moral support for the cause, I think is, in, is, is more now. Because, and also it's more obvious that there's problems with the environment. Um, there's more, and, and it's interesting because for, for me, myself, I'm 49 now, so I'm almost middle-aged, reluctantly so, but it looks like 49 is 49. And I see on the news or hear about the, the latest movement, which is, what do they call it? Extinction, Extinction rebellion. rebellion. Okay, so that's like the latest wave. I mean, there's been yeah. many waves. This is the latest kind of incarnation, let's yeah. say, of it. And it's roughly the same type of principle. You know, quite rebellious, kind of anti-capitalist, wants to see the world in a different way, and that's fine. Um, but it's one wave after another, and you get to a certain age, like, like my, where I am now, where you get the idea, but the title of what they call themselves is, is almost irrelevant. It's the same principle. Yeah. Um, the way I see it, and, and nothing really has changed since the 60s. The 60s is almost like a premonition of what capitalism could become. And I think it has, to a large degree, although it's not completely bad, it has become destructive to the climate and to the environment through, you know, for example, the mass distribution of junk food, um, slaughterhouses, meat eating now proven to be and destructive to the environment. So there's more knowledge now. Um, however, capitalism is also strong, stronger than it was, I think, than in the 60s. But spiritually, so all the stakes, the polarization is, is actually become higher, I think. I, mean, 
and I've been speaking to people for a few years now about sort of their sort of mental health state. And a lot of people are miserable. A lot of people yeah. feel trapped in this sort of material existence because there's they don't know another way. Like that's yeah, the way it's presented. The, yeah, to talk, society is not even it's not even teaching them spirituality. It's not even teaching them culture. So I like to know. think that they have um, a lot of the people I speak to and a lot of things I read. They're searching for answers in things like technology and things like um, I, I I don't know like changing systems, which I think is a good thing. But I feel that a lot of the questions that we need to be asking and possibly a lot of the answers were are not being originated now. They are something that were written down Thousands 5, years. thousand years ago, 10,000 years yeah, ago. Yeah. They've been passed down through generations there. And I mean, one of the things a couple of years ago when I read the Bhagavad Gita, I was like, this is, this, this is incredible. This is sort of like a manual of how to step out of that. of that cycle exactly exactly and, and, and yeah. then other ones like the Tao Te Ching and stuff like that they're yeah, similar yeah. I mean a lot of those spiritual texts I think have that and while in my teens and 20s I definitely rejected that completely and was like that you're anything, having a laugh you're any, having a laugh anything you, yeah. that, <laughs> nothing that old is relevant that all this stuff is rubbish and now I look back on my younger self and I think what an idiot you, you were probably well, thinking. Yeah, that. <laughs> and I think I was just part of a p- product of a system that I was in. And, and now I think, actually, I think that we could do a lot, achieve a lot by looking at some of this wisdom that we already have. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that I, when I was actually, incidentally, about 20, I was at Salford University studying drama. And I, I was looking for something. Because you have to understand, late 80s, early 90s, there was also a bit of this kind of thing. It was the anti-poll tax riots. It was the rebellion against Thatcherism and and yeah. and, and the gre- beginning of the Green Party. So that, that was another wave, is another incarnation of this, roughly the same kind of prototype. And I was part of that. And I was I remember saying, and, and one of the uh, university lecturers, you know, he himself probably a teenager of the 60s, said to me, he said, look, man, you know, drama teacher, he said, it's not about looking towards technology it's actually about looking about getting old things from the old where mankind has known for thousands of years and has tried and tested methods to get out of this of this mess but with a new but present presented in a new way and that was a very important thing he said to me and that stayed with me as you know i was only about 20 at the time and i was quite impressionable but this guy actually had a point and what i mean is that it's, it's about the old ancient wisdom that has tried and tested over tens of thousands of years or where, whatever length of time you want to talk about. And it's not about anything new, but, the, but it needs to be presented in a new way. I'll tell you why. Because um, it needs to be packaged in a new way. I would say it needs to be packaged differently today, even from as it was packaged in the 60s. But that's something for our own movement to, to look at. So it's, not, it's been 50 years. Yeah. So do we need to represent ourselves and say, okay, our, the message is the same, but is the audience different? And do the audience have um, a set, different set of um, priorities? What are they concerned about? And that's probably our challenge is, okay, we're only 50 years old in the West, but are we ourselves becoming the, you know, the, the, the established, yeah. you know, deaf establishment, as it were? And I don't think that's the case. Um, we're probably a lot more mature and better in many ways, because what we're what we're presenting now, compared or say or say not presenting what we're kind of the way we are presenting ourselves or come across to the general public, is is less culty and is more. Um, I think people can really see we've got basically you know we've got something to say, and I think people really need us more as well. This type of and the fact that we may be a little bit off the beaten track, a little bit not mainstream enough for some people is actually an attractive quality for most people. It's actually an attractive. Like here at Bachantamana, we have thousands and thousands of visitors from the Hindi community for cultural reasons. Obviously, we get tens of thousands from Westerners, seekers, you know, um, diggers and dreamers, as they say. Um, we get many, many people in hundreds, if not thousands as, as well. So that makes, and of course, we've got the whole Beatles and George Harrison connection. We've got the estate. We have the, the, the farm. 
So it's all coming together for us quite nicely. But even in a smaller centres, like in cities around Europe, where we have a small preaching centre or, uh, or a loft play, even I think we're able, I think we're starting to strike a chord. But th there's a challenge for us, which is trying to you know extinction rebellion types or you know or woofers worldwide voluntary organic farmers those yeah. who are try or vegans these are the new um i suppose what's the, new, the newest wave if you like of, of of potential sympathizers that's the newest wave and i think that we have to get on that wave and for example issue of veganism we're on the wave but not not as much as perhaps some people would like Many of us are vegan, for example, but not all. It's not fundamental to our culture, veganism. Yeah. Because a lot of Indian food and sweets and, and cultural references and scriptures do refer to the milking of cows and milk products. And we completely believe that cows should be looked after and are allowed to live their full natural lifespan. Um, and we do our best to have a, do that with our own cows. But the question is about congregational members or, or, or even senior members who may still have cow's milk yeah. um, from a, a non himsa or a non, you know, maybe from an, an outside cow that at some point will be slaughtered, you see, which of course we're against. But where do you get that balance? You know, um, can we satisfy the vegan community? And we do quite well. More work probably needs to be done and it's an ongoing process. But when you have a congregation of tens of thousands of um, Hindu community of all ages. So, you know, the, the older the ladies, you know, older ladies of 70, 80 years old, all their life they've had a certain diet. Yeah. And for them to say, oh, you've got, to, you've got to become a vegan now, I think might, is going to be difficult for us. I mean, I've, I've been a vegan for many years. And oh, I that's know good the, to know. The product, the, well, nice the, one, the, well done. Yeah. <laughs> and I just know the um, difficulties of, I mean, it's very hard to yeah. cha I mean, change other people's It's very hard to change other people's, habits. because what it is, it's to do with culture and lifestyle. And yeah. it's, that's why all these waves we were talking about, these extension rebellion, new age, um, or the, the swing in the 60s, whatever yeah. rebellion it, form it took. Um, the, I think what it is, is that it's always the youth, it's always people, and you, yeah. people get to a certain age, they get set in their ways and they can't, and they can't go further. And I think for when it comes to vegan issues, I think it's something that needs to be discussed and, and practiced actually within our younger members or those under a certain age. And I would fit, fit myself as someone who also should be a better vegan. I'm semi-vegan. I think that we need to to work more with the vegan community as they do in some of our centres, like in Scotland and in Wales, and here we already do our best. But I think one of the reasons why people stop rebelling, let's say, against mainstream society after a certain age, even Harry Krishna members, is because you come to an age, I think, where you you know you have you get married and you have children, or some of you do, you know, some of them, and then you realise you they've got to go to school, you've got to get a job, you've got to pay the rent or the mortgage, you've just got to get on with it. And in order to do that, you have to start being practical. Um, there are some if you go to places like Haight Ashbury, San Francisco, or even Atlanta or Glastonbury or, or in the UK, you know, you still see some of the old hippies um, you know, from the sixties. But it's, I don't think that itself is a prototype for that's going to change the world. I think that, um, but what's exciting, I think, about the, the anti-capitalist or the extinction rebellion um, wave is that I think there is some broader support because they have a real point, especially about um, global warming yeah. and these things. Um, and, but uh, but uh, like I kind of indicated earlier, the actual answer is spiritual. Because if everyone became be at least vegetarian, started looking after the cows, you know, even many ve vegans as well, it's, it's all the same side of the same coin. And the spiritual became less um, materialistic as a society, um, more prepared to live a bit more simply. Because no polit no one's going to vote, unfortunately, um, no one's going to vote for a politician that promises them less. You see. Yeah. Whether it's problem. whether it's just no matter which politician it is in which country, even in Russia or China, or whatever, um, no one's going to support someone who's going to collapse the whole system. 
because the problem is if the system collapsed, then you know we're talking that God knows what would happen, and and they've got to continue. The wheel has to gradually slow down. The capitalist wheel, if you like, or the modern system, if you like, is going very very fast. It's a big wheel. Yeah, and you may have one or two people, um, you know, that's trying to throw spokes or spanners in in there, but they may either spring come out or it may slow down the wheel a little bit, but it's not going to take a few years. It takes decades, I think, and it's going to be a very gradual change, and that's what I think we have to work for, and that's also what you start to think as you get older, where you think, okay, yeah, unfortunately, perhaps the world isn't going to change overnight. And all I can do is change myself. I can't change the world. I can't change the prime minister or the president. Um, you know, you become more realistic as you get older about what you can actually do as an individual. And what do you think happens when you change yourself? When you change yourself, you... Well, first of all, you can change yourself. That's one thing you can do, but you can't change other... Well, you, can't, you can't change the world overnight, but you can change yourself overnight. And therefore, set an example to... Um, have a knock on effect on others like the domino effect where you 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 um, do your best that you can and, and human society is such that people do tend to follow others example if you're nasty to everyone in a day then you're probably creating another hundred nasty people because they will just copy what they've experienced you put everyone else in a bad mood for the rest of the day so similarly if you're kind of really good to people then that would also have that effect so we shouldn't underestimate our own influence um, but we should also be realistic about what we can do now we can choose what we eat we can choose how we live we, we can do that and as far as the big wheel that's turning it will take time but we are doing our bit to slow it all down because I think we do have to slow down because it can't logically and Extinction Rebellion or even like the mainstream politicians most of them can see that something has to happen but they're so caught up in it they're part of the wheel that they only really um there's not much that really they can do you see yeah because there's that fear i think of you know uh, oh if they start doing certain things and changing things there's gonna be mass unemployment or whatever or people would have to start moving out of the cities and farming again and how practical would that be um you know, especially in England, for example. And so I think that it has to be, it's actually better if it is gradual. Yeah. Now the challenge is, the challenge is this, can it, we afford to be gradual? Can we afford to, to just sit back and let, let things happen naturally and gradually when the, 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 the fate of the earth is, seems to be more kind of yeah, I desperate? Mean, this know. is one of the points I was going to bring up is that I feel like, that's a good point about the gradual change. But if the things that we're hearing are true and they say within the next 10 years or something, we're past the point of, of no return. No return. Yeah. yeah. And this, this is really what's fueling, I would say, you know, movements like the Extinction Rebellion, but others as well, not just yeah. them. But they're just a good example because it's a, a topical. Yeah. And they're basically saying, look, enough is enough. We've got to really try to throw some spanners in the works and really slow that, slow that wheel down now because we're coming up to the edge of a cliff and we don't want to get you know we, the wheel has to kind of stop before that point and, and that's absolutely right and um, i think that the youth will, will see that more than the, the the older members because the older members have seen it all before and realize that things don't happen like that however we're living in very very exciting times in a sense and worrying times but also exciting times because now we have a situation where all generations have, have, have been aware of such issues. Do you know what I mean? But my dad's generation now, who's in his 70s, he was probably part of the CND marches and, and so forth. Well, my mum was anyway. I don't know about my dad. Um, do you know what I mean by that? In other words, I think now is a very good time to really try and slow down the wheel. But I think that even then, it has to, if you're driving a, a very fast car towards the edge of a cliff, even if you put on the brakes, still there's the process of there's still going to be a skid, you see, where the car can go over, flip over, or something. So it's somehow or other, we've all got to work together to kind of brake, keep braking at a safe pace, so that you know there's no kind of um, 
other type of economical disasters and and and, and gradually and, and do what we can that's all we can do like electric slip and flipping from petrol cars to electric cars is it, to me seems to be a good thing but if we want someone to turn up and say do without cars or to be and unfortunately it's not going to be realistic One of the things that's really important, I think, is the structure of Vedic or ancient Indian society and how different it was to as it is today in the modern world. And that Indians talk about that all the time. And even in in, in, a, in a relatively say hundred years ago, where they had Indian diaspora across Africa, Fiji, Mauritius, across India, Nepal, wherever, and to compared with let's say living in London today, the, the, the contrast is huge where people, even today in part Africa and India, in some areas, would uh, live, in a, live in a very much more kind of family network based society, much more localised kind of mentality, where you have your local deity or your local shrine, uh, and where you would have brahmanas or priests. Um, particularly thousands of years ago, you'd have your priestly class, that would be the most respected, and they would be the heads of society, not the politicians. This is this is the point I'm, I really wanted to make. The idea, the idea in Vedic society was that the the you know the the, the, inter, the intelligentsia or the pious would actually be leading society, and that the politicians would be aspiring to be like that. So the politicians, the kings at the time, because it was before democracy, they would be setting the example or following the example of the brahmanas or the the you know the, the, the the renunciates, yeah. and that the um, the kings or the uh, what you call it the the administrators and the politicians, they would be um, you know giving orders if you like or instructing the vaishas or the business class or the farming community, and, and it would work like that. Um, whereas today, what you have is a situation where it was the, the politicians took over as the leaders that we all kind of try to. Or we hear about all the time in the news. They become the heads or the symbolic figures, if you like. But now it's the business people that have taken over the politicians. Even, for example, in America, where you have, you know, you can't become a leader unless you're a good businessman. And we know what, you know, what I mean. In other words, yes, that's a very good example. A very good example where the business has become the the, the top of society. Yeah. And politicians have to serve the businesses and the multinationals because they can't do much. With, Unless the businesses are happy, and the the clergy, if you like, for want of a better word, are at the bottom. And then there's the labour class or everybody else, you know, the general populace or, or you know, those that don't fit into the other categories, uh, who look look follow the wrong examples. They've got no no examples, and, and the clergy or the priests or the those that are trying to give a spiritual message are basically left at the side. However. Through technology, through Instagram, Facebook, um, obviously the internet in general, Twitter, whatever, there is access to spirituality and spiritual teachings, you see. So there's a polarisation, people saying, well, okay, this, this, this is wrong, and hang on, there's all these different w wisdom traditions of the East, maybe they've got some answers, you see. Yeah. So I think there's going to be, um, not just us, but hopefully we're very much part of it, a a spiritual rejuvenation of society at some point. I think there will be, the polarization will cross over where perhaps the spiritual side will become the stronger. Thank you very much to Radha Mohan Das. It was really nice to be uh, welcomed into the Bhaktivedanta Manor. It's such a lovely place. So whatever your spiritual outlook or sort of non-spiritual outlook, however you experience life, I think um, it's such a nice and welcoming community. And it's this beautiful mock Tudor manor in 
just outside Watford that was donated, as he said, by George Harrison from the Beatles in the 70s. And it's just so welcoming and peaceful and interesting, inspirational, I think. So, yeah, I, I think we could all learn a lot by going to these places which are outside the remit of our everyday lives and outside of the mainstream thinking. And I think it's these, these are important places. So it's a real honour and privilege to be able to go and talk to these people and spend time in these different places. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it'd be nice to hear, hear some feedback and um, thanks again. And I'd also just like to credit the underlying music at the beginning and the intro and in this bit is done by my wonderful and talented friend Graham Walker. So uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I was with him last week and we recorded this lovely, he recorded this lovely piano music for me to put underneath. So thank you to Graham. And uh, also I try and support myself quite badly, but using uh, Patreon, and uh, that's a place where if you appreciate these stories and these conversations, then you can go and donate money to help me carry on doing them. So that's uh, patreon.com forward slash ministry of change. I'll put some links there down below. And you can also check out my website, theministryofchange.org for more videos, blogs, content around mental health, storytelling, how to change yourself and the world and all these things and i look forward to seeing you back here for the next episode and once again apologies for the long break goodbye <laughs> <laughs>